Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about vulnerability in healthcare. It's a topic that, although widely familiar and discussed and understood, is not very precisely defined. Uh, we'll go through uh, some of why it's hard to define what groups are vulnerable in healthcare uh, today, and then we'll also uh, go into further examples of particularly vulnerable populations uh, within military health ethics. So we'll start by defining what vulnerable is, um, and then we'll go over the concept of how, in, in a sense, all patients are vulnerable, that this is broken down into to three domains of physical, emotional, and cognitive. Uh, we'll talk briefly about vulnerable populations in medical research, recognizing that Professor Giordano and Dr. Howe will also have that covered in their talk on research ethics. And then we'll get into the protected group and groups of patients made vulnerable in healthcare and give some specific examples uh, from military medicine of subordinate officers and enlisted military, which can become vulnerable groups, as well as detainees or incarcerated persons. So when defining vulnerability, we see that it means capable of being physically or emotionally wounded, open to attack or damage. So to organize this, vulnerability can be broken down into three domains, physical, emotional, and cognitive. We'll discuss how this plays into medicine and patient vulnerability a little later on, but it effectively comes down to an asymmetry of information, access, status, power, and control. Even as we'll talk about an asymmetry of physical positioning in the room when we talk to patients. When thinking about who's made vulnerable in healthcare, it's a topic that's not well described. In a sense, all patients are vulnerable because they're sick and they depend on someone who has an asymmetry of information and power compared to them to help them. But there's the additional echelon of the entire, of entire groups of people that are made vulnerable over and above the general population of those who are ill. Those individuals are likely to be in more vulnerable populations with factors predisposing individuals, um, including but not limited to poverty, uh, being uninsured, being elderly or mentally ill. Those with chronic health conditions, those who rely on advanced technology for sustaining meaningful, uh, to sustain a meaningful life are all, all vulnerable in ways. Those who have physical barriers to care, such as decreased access due to location, living in a rural area, or limited access to trans transportation. How can we possibly define all of the populations that are made vulnerable? So we'll start by discussing vulnerability implicit in being a patient. And as we mentioned before, this is broken down into physical, emotional, and cognitive. So the very way we encounter patients sets up a physical sense of vulnerability. If their illness alone didn't predispose patients to the feeling of being dependent on another for medication or for support, when we see the people in clinical setting, it's almost always in a position of power for the physician. Whether or not the physician intends this to be true, we physically set people up to feel somehow uh, at a loss of power. So the patient will, say we're seeing a patient in the outpatient clinic, the patient will sit on the clinic table, frequently with their feet dangling off the foot of the bed, nothing to lean against, nowhere really to put their arms, nowhere to put their bag or their phone. So they're just sort of sitting there dangling, waiting for you. And then the physician comes in and stands or sits or leans depending on the situation. And so the, the physician is in a physical position of power, not even to mention the imbalance of the knowledge, the access, the status and the control when a patient is, is sick. And that's why they're seeing a physician. Transition now to the inpatient setting where patients are frequently not just sitting, but lying in a bed, and they have a continual stream of new people coming into their room who, who may or may not introduce themselves, and they perform various exams. They give medications, change sheets, bring food, but the patient is almost always laying in bed. Particularly when the medical teams are rounding, this creates a very intense sense of physical vulnerability. There's a prospective randomized controlled study of post-operative spinal surgery patients looking at physicians standing at the bedside versus physicians sitting at the bedside when they speak to their patients post-operatively. It found that although the actual time spent in the room by the sitting and standing group was the same, patients perceived that it was a statistically longer amount of time, and they also reported a more positive interaction and a better understanding of their condition in the physicians who sat. Improving this relationship with patients can decrease litigation, lengths of stay, medical costs, and improve outcomes. 
our ability to make patients less physically vulnerable just by changing positions and sitting beside them actually makes their care better. Being on their physical level mitigates some sense of their physical vulnerability. Finally, in the operating room, it's an entirely different setting where a patient is wheeled in on a stretcher, then greeted by numerous faces with masks and eye coverings and scrub caps, a team consisting frequently of an anesthesiologist, a nurse anesthetist, a circulating nurse, a scrub tech, a resident or first assist, and finally, the only person who the patient has met before on the day of surgery, the surgeon. They all circulate and perform tasks to set up the patient at, who is at the center of the room and everyone has the best interest at heart, but the patient is lying there completely otherwise alone and, quote, having things done to them. This is hard to avoid in the OR setting, this sense of physical vulnerability for the patient, but it's worthy of recognizing. I learned from a mentor to hold my patient's hands while the anesthetic is being induced, to have a familiar face there during a terrifying time and the reassurance of that physical presence while losing consciousness can really be meaningful to patients. And again, potentially make them feel less vulnerable and alone at that moment. Beyond physical vulnerability is the idea of emotional vulnerability that is brought about by the fear, unknown and despair that can be caused by sickness. It doesn't even have to be a life-threatening illness, but one that makes someone feel powerless or that they've lost control. This is emotionally taxing as frequently patients feel a sense of loss of a normal function of a healthy organ that is now unhealthy or a worsening chronic illness that they've been dealing with for a long time, but is now disabling them even further. The disease process itself puts patients in the position of relying on assistance of others for their shorter long-term well-being and their independence is in some way compromised. Patients who become ill and are removed from family or friends or who are unable to travel or carry on as they previously had are not only mourning the loss of their physical health in some aspect, but also of their social well-being. This is the concept of emotional vulnerability. The idea of cognitive vulnerability brings into consideration how complex medical language is and how disease processes are difficult to be fully understood by patients. This results in many patients' limited ability to fully grasp a treatment course, the risks and benefits of interventions, possible outcomes of treatment, and the best case or worst case scenario that they may encounter during their care. Yet, we ask patients and their families all the time what treatment course they would like to proceed. And this happens with very levels of truly informed consent. So when a person takes their car to the mechanic, for squeaking brakes and the mechanic assesses the vehicle and tells the customer that they need new brake pads or they're likely to lose control of the car and crash, the customer will rightly say, okay, sounds good, here's your money, right? Well, unlike at the mechanic in the hospital, when there's a physical problem with a patient's body, there are frequently a couple of possible options for treatment that could work. And maybe one is better than another by the data, but it depends on what the patient's goals are, what they would like to achieve. So there's not always just one answer. Perhaps a patient would like to avoid surgery for acute appendicitis because they know themselves to have a terrible reaction to general anesthesia. And so a surgeon may offer a course of IV antibiotics for a period of time instead. If a patient is near the end of life and performing um, a therapeutic debulking of a colon tumor may increase their comfort and prolong their life for a few weeks, they may choose to do that. Or they may decide that the time they have left is, is more valuable and they don't want to risk possible complications related to an operation and the pain related to surgery. So unlike when a person takes their car to the mechanic to be fixed, human beings have goals and preferences, which makes medical care less cookie cutter. One size does not fit all and the whole, the bone is broken, I need to fix it, is not always the cause and effect we experience. We ask patients all the time which therapeutic option they prefer and what course of treatment will meet their goals of care. This is a big ask given the complexities and nuances of possible complications and likely outcomes. This can become especially challenging for patients and families near the end of life. Respect for patient autonomy in the absence of guidance and patient-tailored discussions with physicians can place an undue burden of decision-making on families to either proceed with comfort measures, which many families will equate with pulling the plug, or continue all therapeutic and medical measures, which many families will equate with giving the patient a chance or holding out for a miracle. We can't blame families in these cases for trying something, lest they live the rest of their lives knowing that they didn't give their loved one a chance, which was an option that was laid out to them. The way that we can potentially mitigate the burden of placing 
patients and their loved ones in positions where cognitive vulnerability could affect the way they experience and remember their loved ones passing is by preventing a full menu of options as being equally good options at the time of the end of life. So many physicians spend their entire careers subspecializing in particular pathologies. And in these difficult situations, it's critical that beneficence meld with autonomy to promote shared decision-making to bridge the gap of cognitive vulnerability. So transitioning from the idea that in some senses, all patients are vulnerable by the virtue of the fact that they are sick, we now focus briefly on vulnerable groups that are very well-defined. And that is in the aspect in the scope of research ethics. Those groups that require specific protections due to their definition as being quote, protected or vulnerable as described by the FDA. So vulnerable populations are those who may be at higher risk of any given research initiative that accommodations or adjustments may be made um, to the design of the research that takes into account the specific needs of these groups in order to minimize harm. The FDA defines them as prisoners, children, pregnant women, handicapped people, mentally disabled persons, or economically or educationally disadvantaged persons. Although some of these groups used to be totally excluded from research trials, it's now more generally accepted that they should be involved in, but with additional measures to ensure participation uh, occurs in an ethical manner. These groups are all vulnerable for different reasons, and there are restrictions for research with vulnerable groups. And this is not to go into too much detail, um, but just to point out that the Declaration of Helsinki, the Belmont Report, and other groups have laid out restrictions for research within vulnerable groups specifically pointing out that they should receive specific protections, that they should not be inappropriately included or excluded from research, particularly if the research could affect their welfare. The Council for International Organizations of Medical Sciences interestingly says that vulnerable subjects should be involved in research only when it cannot be carried out with less vulnerable subjects. This could be questioned because we learn about individuals, groups of individuals, and entire populations because of research recording the findings of what we observe. If we exclude entire groups based solely on their categorization of vulnerability, we may be denying them and ourselves a chance to learn potential differences and outcomes or responses to interventions that could allow us to better understand them and thus take better care of them. Certainly this research needs to be done in a voluntary way with true informed consent, but can be very valuable to consider doing. For example, the incarcerated patient population, appropriately deemed to be a vulnerable group due to unethical research activity and a history of exploitation in clinical research trials, they're a very difficult group to study. But as a result, we know almost nothing about them from the medical perspective. So the United States imprisons more people than any country in the world. Currently, there are about 2.2 million people incarcerated, and that's about the size of the city of Houston. It's a large number of people, and it disproportionately favors racial and ethnic minorities. It's a relatively new phenomenon since the war on drugs in 1970, and it's gradually improving over time. But what, what is interesting is that when you look for what operations inmates have when they're incarcerated, there are no surgical data. So if we're just talking specifically about surgery in this case, if you do a PubMed search, there are no surgical outcome studies, particularly as it pertains to incarcerated patients. Incarcerated patients are not included in national databases, and it is very difficult to obtain data from facilities, making them really difficult to study. So three of the largest national databases utilized for research do not include data from incarcerated patients. This includes the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, which as it defines itself is the nation's most comprehensive source of hospital care data. It also includes the National Cancer Database, which is a collaboration jointly sponsored by the American College of Surgeons and the American Cancer Society. And the idea is that it's a clinical oncology database sourced from hospital registry data collected in more than 1,500 COC accredited facilities. And it, the data are used to analyze and track patients with cancer and their treatments and their outcomes and how they respond. There are no incarcerated patients included in this database. The American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, which is a nationally validated risk-adjusted outcomes-based program to measure and improve the quality of surgical care. 
is not including any incarcerated patients. Although in all of these databases, hospitals participate who take care of incarcerated patients. They're just selected out. So the lack of information about these patients, um, it's, it's, it's challenging and it, their medical problems of incarcerated patients are poorly docu documented as a result. Infirmary data are not public. And even with an IRB for a protocol, data can be nearly impossible to obtain. So what we do know about incarcerated patients and, and specifically surgery is that the last time the Bureau of Justice Statistics did a survey was in 2004. And at that time, the data points that we have include 12.7% of inmates had surgery at some point while incarcerated. There was no other information uh, gathered regarding diagnosis, outcomes, or anything else. So one thing that we have learned about the, in the medical data about the incarcerated patients is that a systematic review and meta-analysis analyzing 22,000 imprisoned men and women around the world demonstrated that there was a lifetime prevalence of PTSD as high as 18% in male prisoners and as high as 40% in female prisoners. As in comparison, the lifetime prevalence of PTSD in the general population in Western countries is 5% for men and 10.4% for women. This equates to a greater than three times higher prevalence for PTSD in men who have been incarcerated and a four times higher prevalence in women who have been incarcerated. So knowing what we have learned from some military studies, uh, we found that um, a pro-inflammatory milieu may dispose people to autoimmune diseases. And they found that veterans with PTSD are found to have increasing incidence of thyroiditis, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and increased risk of coronary artery disease. So given the higher incidence of PTSD in incarcerated patients, are they more likely to have autoimmune diseases as well? Well, anecdotally, yes, but there's no research to prove it. So can we identify these patients sooner? Can we treat them better? First, we have to be able to know that it's an increased risk so that we can, we can look for it and we can be better for them. So anecdotal issues with taking care of incarcerated patients include delays in care, chronic medical conditions, which are poorly controlled, uh, physicians being unaware or unequipped for the increased rates of traumatic brain injury, mental illness, and sexual abuse and other comorbidities that are higher in the incarcerated patient population. There are also limitations in care. So corrections officers are always present during exam. The patients are always shackled and they have limited mobility post-operatively. In fact, uh, we found locally that there was a greater than four times more likelihood to have a venous thromboembolic event after surgery when compared to a matched group from the general population. And a lot of this just has to do with ambulation. It also has to do with absent or limited uh, visitation postoperatively, so people don't have their family or loved ones there to advocate, advocate for them to get up and out of bed. So to talk about all of this with research in the incarcerated patient population is to just describe a compounding vulnerability. So many groups, including incarcerated patients, become more vulnerable because the logistical barriers to studying them. There, there may be unique environmental or situational or treatment related factors that could be causing medical problems such as PTSD and autoimmune diseases that we don't know about because of the challenges, challenges of researching these groups. So this is where vulnerable groups in research become vulnerable groups in healthcare. We don't know how to best take care of them because there are barriers to studying them and we can't understand their diagnoses and outcomes if we can't write it down and publish it. So. Knowing this, we'll now transition to the ethical care of detainees or incarcerated patients as a vulnerable group. So when patients become incarcerated or when individuals become incarcerated or detainees became, become imprisoned, they, they start losing their ability to make decisions. So they can no longer choose what they eat or what they do in their free time, how they get from place to place, if they get to go outside, if they get to play sports, if they get to exercise and when when they get to sleep or where they get to sleep. They don't get to decide who they surround themselves with, what they wear, or where they go. Their schedule, their clothing, and their food is all outlined and run on somebody else's clock. It's run by, it's run by the institution. 
Um, but one, one right that uh, incarcerated patients largely do maintain is their right to bodily integrity. So um, the, the refusal of care in this, this vulnerable patient population um, is unique. So the right to refuse treatment, um, it's determined that a free person has the right to refuse medical treatment even when it is necessary to save their own life. The 14th Amendment protects a liberty interest in prisoners not being treated against their will. So, quote, a competent person has a constitutional protected liberty interest in refusing unwanted medical treatment. However, detainees' right to refuse care is different. So to be clear, if someone has, if an inmate has chickenpox or tuberculosis, they are going to be forced to undergo treatment for that because it becomes a public health problem. Similarly, if there is an individual who has a uh, mental illness and it's, it's thought that if it goes untreated that they may be a, a violent threat or to themselves or to the people around them and um, a compromise to security, they, they can be medicated for that against their will. They may also be forced to accept treatment that is necessary to protect their own health from permanent injury. So in the case of um, Washington versus Harper in 1990, Walter Harper was a mentally ill state prisoner uh, who was being made to take his antipsychotic drugs against his will. Here he challenged the constitutionality of Washington's prison policy, contending that the involuntary administration of antipsychotic drugs without a judicial hearing deprived him of due process. Although the court did note that Harper has a liberty interest in being free from arbitrary administration of drugs, the US Supreme Court identified with the state that an untreated mentally ill inmate may result in violence and thus compromise the safety of the prison system. So treating physicians can treat over objection if there is a mental order and the patient's gravely disabled or if they pose a serious risk of harm to self, others, or property. They need to undergo an appropriate hearing, including uh, presence of a non-treating psychiatrist, a psychologist, and the associate superintendent of the prison. And periodic reviews are also required in order to ensure that the treating over um, refusal continues to be appropriate over time. Expert decision did satisfy Harper's right to due process in this ruling. Moreover, it was decided that due process does not require a judicial hearing before treatment because the inmates interests were thought to be better served where the decision to medicate is made by a medical professional rather than by judges. So we'll talk about hunger strikes now, and this is sort of a, a form of treatment over um, objection. So what is a hunger strike? Well, the World Medical Association describes it as a voluntary total fasting of taking water only for 48 to 72 hours as a means of protest. And why do inmates strike? Well, with a, um, uh, an informal survey of the uh, upstate New York prison uh, infirmaries, uh, they determined that it was a bargaining tool to achieve a personal goal. So such reasons would be to gain protective custody, to regain commissary privileges that had previously been lost, to change cells or cell block, to eat food only delivered by family, to be moved to a prison closer to family, or to leave solitary confinement. So who can decide to go on a hunger strike? Can you decide to go on a hunger strike? Yeah, you can go on a hunger strike. Can LeBron James go on a hunger strike? Sure. Can my four-year-old son go on a hunger strike? No, but that's probably an issue of willpower. But can an incarcerated person go on a hunger strike? Well, as we discussed, the right to refuse care is different for incarcerated patients, especially if it's likely to pose a risk to the public health, or in this case, permanent damage to his or her own health. So when is involuntary treatment considered? When there's evidence of end organ damage, when the incarcerated patient has a pre-existing comorbidity that may hasten permanent harm, when they've had a prolonged hunger strike, which is defined as greater than 21 days, or when the patient is less than 85% of their ideal body weight. And so the way that this looks in, in some prison systems is that the attending physician taking care of the patient or rounding in the infirmary uh, will round on that patient every day and will do an assessment of the vital signs and a physical exam. Uh, we'll record all of those findings, including taking a weight, 
and describe to that inmate what the risks are of proceeding with the hunger strike versus the benefits of cessation of the hunger strike. And we'll make sure that they are mentally well well taken care of and that they understand the risks. And until one of these four points happens, they observe and they allow them to strike. But it's thought that involuntary treatment uh, should should be pursued when when one of these uh, points is raised because um, there is risk of permanent injury to the patients to the patient's health, and the prison system is thought to be responsible for maintaining their health. So if we do involuntarily feed, what does it look like? It starts with IV fluids and, and electrolytes and then proceeds to TPN, total parenteral nutrition, which we know we can't be on for extended periods of time because it can be very hard on the liver. So ultimately, if the strike is going on long enough, it's transitioned to tube feeds, which you can imagine that this becomes a very uh, difficult situation because in order to administer tube feeds, you need access to the stomach. And if the patient isn't willing to put food in their mouth, the likelihood that they're going to let you put a nasogastric tube in without some sort of um, pushback is pretty low. Um, so unfortunately, when this does happen, it frequently results in the need for restraints. Um, and, and people can get hurt. The patient can get hurt. The nurses can get hurt. The physicians can get hurt. And, and it ends up being um, a really uh, physically and cognitively challenging situation, I think, for everybody. And I don't think anybody likes it. Ultimately, if it gets far enough, um, a nasogastric tube can't be in place forever because it can cause erosion of the sinuses and it can cause infection and bleeding. And um, so a gastric tube needs to be placed in the operating room. And again, you can imagine that the more parties you involve in, in, in treatment against refusal, the more difficult it is to accomplish the goal of pushing back against the patient who presumably has capacity. Because at this point, it needs to involve a, an anesthesiologist, it needs to involve a surgeon, and both of those individuals need to be willing to follow a court order rather than uh, the wishes of a patient who presumably has capacity. The good news is, is that it rarely gets to this point. Um, this is a, a review written um, in North Carolina that basically shows the huge number of hunger strikes end before the fourth day. Um, there are some that proceed longer, uh, but but the large the large number of um, hunger strikes don't last too long. So the question is raised: Is is it unethical to feed an adult with capacity over objection? Well, many say that it is. So the Declaration of Malta in 1991 states that it is ethical to allow a determined hunger striker to die in dignity rather than to submit to repeated interventions against his or her will. That forcible feeding is never ethically acceptable, even if it is intended to benefit. Feeding accompanied by threats, coercion, force or use of physical restraints is a form of inhumane and degrading treatment. Similarly, the World Medical Association Declaration of Tokyo in 1975 states that where a prisoner refuses nourishment and is considered by a physician as being capable of forming an unimpaired and rational judgment concerning the consequences of such voluntary refusal of nourishment, he or she shall not be fed artificially. The International Committee of the Red Cross states that it is opposed to force feeding or forced treatment. It is essential that the detainees' choices be respected and their human dignity preserved. Although others say that it's not unethical. So in a, in a Connecticut Supreme Court ruling in 2012, it was stated that the state's interest in a prisoner's health and safety of the institution, of the out, of, of the institution outweigh a prisoner's common law right to bodily integrity, stating that it does not violate the prisoner's First and 14th Amendment rights to free speech and privacy, and that the weight of international authority does not prohibit medically necessary force feeding. There were similar, similar rulings made by the New York Court of Appeals, Seventh District Court, the U.S. District Judge of California, and in the state of Utah after they did have a death of a starved inmate from a hunger strike. The Federal Bureau of Prisons policy is to not to delay feeding if an immediate threat to life or a possible permanent damage to health arises. Others have said that a hunger strike amounts to a suicidal act. So the military policy on this is, is very clear. 
Um, and this is not just on hunger strikes, but this is care of detainees. So to go through the, the highlights of each of these points is really important. So healthcare personnel in the military have a duty in all matters affecting the physical and mental health of de detainees to uphold humane treatment and ensure that detainees are not subject to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Healthcare personnel are also charged with the medical care of detainees to have a duty to protect the detainee's physical and mental health and to provide appropriate treatment for disease. And this care should be similar, as it points out, to the care provided to US military service members. Healthcare personnel shall not certify or participate in the certification of the fitness of detainee detainees for any form of treatment or punishment that is not in accordance with applicable law. Healthcare personnel are not to participate in application of physical restraints unless such a procedure is necessary for the protection of the physical or mental health or the safety of the detainee or necessary for the protection of other detainees or those treating, guarding, or otherwise interacting with them. Healthcare uh, agents are generally, healthcare is generally provided with consent of the detainee. However, they do have the right to refuse treatment except for life-saving emergency medical care provided that the patient is incapable of providing consent or if it is necessary to protect the public health such as the, to prevent the spread of communicable diseases as we discussed earlier with the chicken pox and with tuberculosis and other such communicable diseases. The medical treatment or intervention may be directed without the consent of the detainee in the case of a hunger strike, attempted suicide, or other attempted serious self-harm. So when treatment is necessary to prevent death or serious harm. Finally, involuntary treatment must be preceded by a thorough medical and mental health evaluation and counseling concerning the risks and benefits of carrying out um, uh, medically appropriate care. And it states again that the policy includes parity in which detainees are entitled to treatment similar to that provided to US service members. So here we'll transition to um, care for military service members. Um, some argue that the medical treatment of the armed forces um, uh, creates the possibility to have dual loyalties and that the idea of having uh, vulnerable parties within um, uh, certain groups is, is um, frequent. So the command structure of the military can put subordinate officers and, enlist, um, and the enlisted in positions of relative vulnerability as it pertains to their health. So you'd wonder, are some military members volunteered for some practices due to peer pressure for fear or loss of promotion or status? Medical treatment as deemed necessary to the mission may supersede an individual's wishes. Existing regulations do not limit medical related orders to, pro to products approved by the FDA, so such as vaccinations that may be used under emergency use. Um, the uh, 10 U.S. Code 1107 dictates a high level of approval that has to happen before non-approved drugs are given to active duty to ensure sufficient informed consent. But under the UCMJ, Refusal has resulted in punitive measures, including rank reduction, doctor pay, jail time, or dishonorable discharge in some cases. Although again, it has to be a very high level of approval that um, a certain intervention has to go through before it's given to active duty. Awareness of the dual loyalties and making an effort to respect individual autonomy while safely carrying out the mission is critical. So simply recognizing um, that dual loyalties uh, exist and that this may create a conflict between individual autonomy and, and sort of the good of the mission um, is the first step in, in trying to minimize the harm to autonomy uh, while maximizing um, the success of the mission. Stepping back to vulnerable groups um, as, as, as uh, separate from the uh, general population of, of people who are vulnerable just by virtue of the fact that they're patients. Um, so as we talked about, um, protected groups as described by the FB, FDA for research are very clear. Children, prisoners, pregnant women, handicapped, mentally disabled, and economically or disadvantaged people. 
And there are other entire groups of people that we're not going to get into discussing uh, today, but it's not limited to the following, but people with varied cultural or religious beliefs, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, that the standard of care is not in their in their belief system for transfusion of blood products, for example. Um, so these patients become vulnerable by virtue of the fact that that their belief system sort of prevents the the physicians from being able to take care of them by the standard that by the standards that that they've learned to practice um, and so they they're at somewhat of a disadvantage for needing to represent themselves in a very clear way so that their beliefs are followed and 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 um, their goals are achieved racial and ethnic minorities um, are another very vulnerable uh, group because of many reasons in, including a mistrust in the system there's implicit bias everywhere there's there's racism everywhere and this is something that that I think addressing and recognizing um, uh, is the first step in being able to get rid of it and and uh, demarginalize groups that are marginalized and and make less vulnerable those that are made vulnerable by these social constructs Women are vulnerable, um, historically have not been included in the same numbers as men for, for research initiatives. Um, and LBGTQ plus patients also very vulnerable uh, given um, uh, the limited education that, that many people have on how to take care of people. Um, and there are many, many groups aside from these, uh, some of which we discussed at the beginning. Uh, but as you can see, the, the concept of vulnerability in healthcare has, has many overlapping um, definitions. Uh, you could consider all patients vulnerable in those three domains that we talked about, the physical, emotional, and cognitive domains. Um, and then there are other groups that are even further vul made vulnerable uh, based on uh, societal constructs or by... Um, uh, cultural or religious beliefs that are not uh, considered, quote, the norm, um, and that uh, that there are many groups that we need to pay attention to. So this all sort of feeds back into the physician-patient relationship and taking care of that person who is sitting right in front of you and understanding what their goals are when you're able to, and really incorporating that um, into, into your plan of care. Um, you know, talking about all patients being vulnerable um, in certain senses, just being cognizant of, of where you're standing, where you're sitting, how you're interacting with the patient and sort of incorporating them as much as possible into the decision making process. So they feel they have a voice and they feel that they're being heard and, and listened to. Um, so vulnerability refers to the state of physical, emotional, and cognitive stability that is in danger of being disturbed or destroyed due to being susceptible to destabilizing influences, which are many. So, you know, this doesn't uh, define vulnerability. This, this just opens up the conversation to understand that it's a very big picture. It's a very big definition. Um, and what it can come down to is, is uh, taking, taking good, responsible, ethical care of patients um, is a result of, of frequently listening to them and uh, doing your best to understand what their goals are um, and, and participating in shared decision-making uh, to the point that we can minimize um, physical, emotional, and cognitive vulnerabilities um, and, and try to understand patients' perspectives in order uh, to, to mitigate the big groups of people who are marginalized or made vulnerable um, by our social constructs. Um, so that is what I have for the day. I'm happy to talk about this um, uh, separately or more extensively at any time. I really appreciate the time. Thanks.